morning friends today our guest speaker is dr tapan sekia from mumbai he will be lecturing on hematopoietic hematopoietic stem cell transplant getting away getting closer this webinar is brought to you by mumbai hematology group supported by netpo oncology and managed by perfect square i thank mr james raja kumar and the team from netpo mr yash kalpesh and the team from perfect square executive committee of mumbai hematology group our chief guest today dr purvesh parikh from uh, mumbai our chief speaker guest speaker dr tapan sekia from mumbai one of our discussants who are themselves eminent hematologist and hemato oncologist new participants for sparing your sunday morning coming saturday 29th of april from 7 pm onwards we will have our guest speaker dr laura mckellis from uh, milwaukee speaking to us on aml better alternatives to 7 plus 3 for whom how and why and next sunday morning 11:30 am we have dr fakuri from switzerland speaking to us on how i diagnose and treat atypical hemolytic uremic syndrome our discussants today include various important persons which are alphabetically put up here we have dr anand gokarn associate professor department of medical oncology at tmc mumbai dr chirag shah director department of stem cell transplant hematology oncology apollo hospitals international ahmedabad dr faraz khan dnb medical oncology third year resident fmri gurugram dr hari menon professor department of hematology and medical oncology in bmt physician from st john's medical college hospital bangalore Dr. Lieutenant Colonel Kundan Mishra, Professor of Internal Medicine, Department of Clinical Hematology and Stem Cell Transplant, Army Hospital R and R. Dr. Malikarjun Kalashetty, Consultant in Clinical Hematology, Hematology Oncology in BMT, Comprehensive Cancer Center, Manipal Hospital, Bangalore. Dr. Ravin Katte, Deputy Director, Clinical Research Center, Actrac, Professor, Department of Medical Oncology, TMC, Mumbai. Dr. Suparno Chakraborty. md pgi mr chandigarh doctor of medicine from university of birmingham hod department of bmt in hematology dnsh new delhi director cellular therapy and immunology manashi chakraborty foundation india now it's time to introduce our special guest for the day who is going to inaugurate our webinar and that's dr purvish parikh is md dnb ficp phd ecmo cpi professor and head of clinical hematology at mahatma gandhi medical college hospital and mahatma gandhi university of medical sciences and technology jaipur he is ex professor and head medical oncology tmh mumbai executive director indian cooperative oncology network founder president asian cardio oncology society and integrated academic society of clinical oncology past president of sarc federation for oncologists an indian society of medical and pediatric oncology emeritus editor south asian journal of cancer and international journal of molecular and immuno oncology is founder member board of director asian oncology society author of 19 books 36 chapters in books and 200 plus scientific articles i request him to inaugurate our webinar and give some words of wisdom for our young members uh Uh, i don't see that he has joined as yet so probably we'll move on with our guest speaker's introduction just give me a minute So let's go to our guest speaker for the day, Dr. Tapan Sekia, and uh, he does not require any introduction to anybody from this country. Uh, I'm just completing the formality. He's director of Onco Sciences and senior medical oncologist, Jaslok Hospital and Research Center, Mumbai. He has worked as medical oncologist at Tata Memorial Hospital, Parel, Mumbai, from 1981 to 2004. 
Subsequently, he has worked as medical oncologist and bone marrow transplant physician at Jaslok Hospital from 2004 to 12, followed by Prince Ali Khan Hospital, Mumbai until 2022. He's an experienced research director with a demonstrated history of working in the philanthropy industry. He's skilled in oncology, hematology, clinical research, and medical education. He's a strong healthcare services professional with MBBS and MD in medicine from Assam Medical College. He's deeply involved in educational, social, and developmental work in oncology. He's a member of ASH, API, ISH, TM, ISMPO, UICC, and AICR. I request him to lecture us on allogenic hematopoietic stem cell transplant, getting away, getting closer. Over to Dr. Tapan. Thank you, Dr. Agarwal, for this kind invitation. I, I didn't think that I'll have to talk on transplant anymore. Good morning to everyone in the panelists and uh, those who are participants in today's webinar. Uh, you must be, let me share my screen. Um, I was uh, giving this talk at Guwahati some time ago, maybe a month or a little uh, before that. And uh, somewhere from the corner, Dr. Agrawal was listening and said that, why don't you give it an give another talk? But that was for the general public. It was simple to do. Now, in front of real transplanters, it's a bit tough. Uh, but anyway, I think that's about, we'll go ahead and do the job and the panelist will uh, touch upon the subjects in allotransplants. This enigmatic title that I had chosen that time, there are two reasons for this. One is personal and one is scientific. The personal one is that when you have crossed the age of 70, not many people would be doing uh, labor intensive work like transplant. So one is trying to get, get away, but also you can't get away and stay, become closer. That's, that's life for you. And then of course, scientific one is that uh, when we started doing transplants, allogenic transplants, overcoming HLE barrier is nearly impossible. We'll so show some data about it, very simple data. And then now we can do that. And that's last 20 years, it has been uh, possible for 25 years or so. Um, after this, Italians started working on the Megadose CD34, the Perusia group. And the cyclophosphamide, the enigmatic uh, molecule, it keeps on coming back in new orbitals, wherever we work in oncology, hemato-oncology, everywhere. That's a lovely molecule. Probably we have not unraveled its mystery completely yet. Let's see what it does in transplant setting, in yellow transplant. This is a slide I've become a little, uh, uh, you know, using it uh, quite often now. Uh, anything that we do in our life, whether it's on a work or home or any other thing, this everything uh, uh, comes down to demand of a certain situation and the kind of supply we can really perform. So it's true in case of allogenic transplant as well. Then when this demand and supply you are trying to meet, question comes up immediately, the quality and quantity. You got to maintain that. Then only you can deliver the good in a proper way. And when you're doing that, demand and supply, quality and quantity we are looking at, economy comes in. When the economy comes in, your accountability comes in. When accountability comes in, you have to sustain. And sustainability, my belief, it comes from training and technology. So in an institute where stem cell transplant is being done, we need a good technology, good training, then only you can sustain the program. The talk proper, the allogenic uh, hematopoietic cell transplantation is all about understanding immunology better. That's what we have to keep in mind every day. So much uh, is available in the literature, old and new, and then the future we are looking at, it's all about immunology of the host, immunology of the donor, immunology of the environment, immunology of the food we eat. So everything about it. And then uh, our, our uh, understanding is not complete. We continue to learn, try to keep improving. And I believe that uh, my friend Suporno will uh, keep saying again and again, I believe that LO transplant is at the crossroads and we really need to improve. So this is a slide, uh, very important. 
for me, it's a holy grail and it's for everyone, every transplanter. This is the dog experiment, Donald Thomas and team's work. As you can see here, the top curve, the dog DLMS fully and the GVHD prophylaxis and what happened to them in a the long-term survival. Then you look at the middle curve when they were given again match dog DLA match, and then they were not given any methotrexate prophylaxis, how the survival came down. And in those days, 60s and 70s, if you do mismatch transplant, whether in a human being or in a dog, the survival was extremely poor. It was nearly impossible to overcome the HLA barrier. So it remains true even today when we do number of match unrelated transplants, then we do haplotransplants and mismatch unrelated transplants. So we need to keep that there are lots of barriers yet to cross. Now, one leukocyte in antigen mismatch, whether you do sibling donor, you do mud, you say that the registry that I would say that probably it's okay to go ahead and do it. But if you see some single institute data, there's a conflicting one. Seems that immunology, even with that one antigen mismatch, or even, even beyond that, even sometimes in amino acid mismatch also might be a might be responsible for rejection of a graft or causing other serious complications. So this is one area to the HLA system. We are continuing to understand how to choose a right recipient and donor pair. Some data, because that's important to show. EBMT data, as you can see in this non-relapse motility over the decades continuing to improve. Uh, so there is less mortality now, but in the 1980s, now there's a very significant difference. And we all believe that it's not, not because, only because of supportive care we keep talking about, it's more because of the molecular typing we can do it uh, in a much, much better way. And because of that, you don't get to see kind of early mortality. It's at the beginning of the curve, you get to see the mortality is coming down. That's That seems to be mainly because of uh, we can choose the recipient and donor pair very well. While it's happening, um, mortality is coming down, the survival also improving. But if you put those two graphs together, there's still a gap of relapse of the primary disease, which is um, almost 30 to 40% of them. That means still we have a lot of work to do, how to get rid of the primary disease. And when we do more and more difficult transplants. That's EBMT latest data, 2020 published. And one, let's go to data come to US data, 2021 summary slides, some of those. And then as we are saying the crossroads, 2020 may be an aberration, but even though in coming decades, 10 years or 20 years, there is a possibility that we might see the dipping of allogenic transplantations. There is a reason to think about it. And we have to be very innovative to keep the transplant up in different hematologic conditions. Donor scenario, um, it, the, the scenario in the US will be completely different what we get to do in India. We'll show it in the later one. And then mud transplants still remains at the top of the list in um, Western countries. And US, you can see that it's going up, but MRD is coming down clearly. We'll show the reason. And then of course, as you can see the cord blood, it's coming down. It's very clear that when elderly people 65 plus, you do a transplant, you can't get a match related donor. Siblings are old, they are no more there, definitely. And you can't do cord blood because you are not going to get enough better. So, but in pediatric age group, you still have a uh, sizable number of patients. People might get a related donor, but even there in Western countries because of small families across. So we are seeing the pattern that MAD still remains to be, but haplo seems to be slowly picking up. We'll keep seeing it as you go. But cord blood is the story that was such a success story. It started in the late 1980s, 88, 89. After that, when it did go up very uh, um, exponentially, still remains in Japan, but it seems in the Western countries, uh, it's coming down. It's mainly because of haplo transplants and doing cord blood. Cord blood transplant is not 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 very easy. There are so many issues. We might say that immunologically naive, but there are many other issues because of that naivety. 
Uh, it looks like the world is uh, seems to be forgetting about the bone marrow as a source, but in India, it's again, there'll be some difference between, but peripheral blood, even in children, you can collect it, and that's why it's keep, it's, it's going up, up. So peripheral blood is now that we have so many kind of machines that it's bound to be, and you can manipulate the number, the quantity, the quality, and the component of those cells, which is probably bone marrow, it's a little difficult. But one should, those who are doing transplant might have a basic knowledge of bone marrow collections, harvesting and uh, manipulation of the cells. And then of course, freezing or not freezing, give directly to them. So haploid is some issues, we'll just discuss graft sources, diseases, conditioning regimens, TVSD prophylaxis and causes of death. Very short. Um, yeah. The one that uh, uh, US, you get, get to see the disease, uh, yeah, that, uh, AML is the leader, that naturally. AML, then along with uh, myelodysplastic syndrome, that's some of the top ones that where you get to the patients. We don't have, though have improved a lot, but we still don't seem to have a real good treatment to get rid of the disease, in, especially in older patients with AML and myelodysplastic syndrome chemotherapy. But but that as newer drugs are coming, that's that's one thing. And the CAR T cell therapy coming in, mostly in lymphoid, but as time goes by, we might get to see in uh, myeloid disorders as well. And then we will see that uh, probably this curve, it will be quite a challenge for transplant to keep it at like this. This debate will never go away, myeloablative or non-myeloablative. One thing is that with myeloablative, you want to get rid of the disease, but at the same time, you don't want to kill the recipient. That's, that's again, then reduce intensity. So debate goes on because when we do a transplant, bringing two cells together, there's so much of immunology. So induction conditioning regimen is an important one, but at the same time, which one is better than the other? I don't think we'll be ever be able to uh, sort it out. Now that because of the paper from the AML from United States, many people are vocal about it. It has to be myeloablative. Uh, perhaps we have not heard the last word yet about the conditioning regimen. TBSD prophylaxis, um, as time goes by, you can see in haploendetical transplants, most people, people continue to work that in orange, you see the calcineurin inhibitors and with sing another drug or triple drugs. But the time goes by because of the work from Johns Hopkins University, it's going, going up. So nearly everyone is getting PTCY now, plus minus others. But PTCY is the one that we are all talking about and we love this molecule now. What's happening in other type of transplants? So the match related donor transplants. So there you see that's a calcineurin inhibitors still the most preferred regimen. But as time goes by, people trying to look at role of PTCY here, and it's going up in 2020, a fifth of those. And it seems it might just go up more because PTCY has a kind of mechanism that can uh, probably might do better than that. There needs to be a randomized trial to come up with answer. We hope we'll get a randomized trial and get an answer to that, whether PTCY or ATG. Much unrelated MAT transplant also, similar picture, calcineurin inhibitor remains to be the most preferred one, but as time goes by, a quarter of them are receiving PTCY plus minus other drugs. So it seems that PTCY is here to stay. Some causes of death, uh, first 100 days and beyond 100 days, organ failure still remains a problem. That means our selection of the cases and kind of the conditioning regimen we, we are using at this moment of time and it seems uh, in, uh, needed, it needs to be improved definitely. But as time goes by, it's a primary disease. Majority of them has gone. So uh, I think that conditioning regimen or the immune modulation you are doing at this moment of good, but there's a huge scope to improve this uh, outcome of allergenic transplantations. Similarly, same picture, we'll not go into it. Let's go to some of the Indian registry data uh, because uh, we have an Indian Society for Blood and Marrow Transplant Registry that is active for a long period of time, um, early part of the millennium, but uh, we waited for some time to, be, uh, to register the whole group. Now we call it ISBMT now. 
few years ago we did that because there was a necessity. You need a voice for transplant in the country, and then we need to work together. So we have activity report, outcome report, still a challenge across the country, collect the data and look at individual diseases, but still people are trying to get some activity that are in certain diseases. So more than 20,000 transplants have been done in 2020. It'll be more, to 2020 did come down, all, all, all know that why it happened, but again, it picked up in 2021, 22. We'll see the data, our um, conference coming up in a couple of weeks time, uh, fresh data will be available. But there are a number of centers, it was 105 at that moment of time, and uh, gone up beyond that now to know that another uh, five to 10 transplant centers will start registering sending the data. So it looks like nearly 80% of the data in the country we are being able to uh, uh, get from the various centers, at least the activity that are coming. Uh, we have it. So 83 to 820, um, 2020 is a whole, uh, if you see, this is all mass related donor, then of course, um, beginning of the millennium, but towards the later part of the decade, and came up with the mass transplant became possible because there were centers, we could develop the uh, communication with uh, uh, different centers in the world, go to the registries. Um, and then, uh, then again, an Indian registry did come up um, about a decade and a half ago because of that. But what we're get, getting to see is the haplos because haplos are coming up, which is much easier to pick up a, a donor from the uh, family. Uh, anyone there in a big family in India, uh, then you can pick up. So MAD is one that which just remains uh, more or less stable. But we do have Indian registries and the one that Datri has been doing a uh, tremendous amount to go. So uh, indication as you get to see, uh, which is quite different from the, the US or even in um, EBMT, um, uh, lots of transplants are done for the non-malignant conditions like thalassemia and other hemoglobinopathies, aplastic anemia is still a sizable number. Of course, a quarter of them AML and then some ALLs are being done. CML, what used to be, has come down tremendously. So this is the whole list where you get to see the starting from acute myeloid leukemia, thalassemia, plastic anemia, and some of the rare conditions also. People are doing transplants whenever there is the right indications to do. Um, most centers became active, majority of the centers in the country uh, after 2010. So this might reflect the kind of things that you are doing in the country. Again, um, thalassemia, and um, plastic anemia remains major indications, especially in the young age group. AML has remained same, ALL has remained same, CML has continued to shrink, and there are other areas where people are trying to do uh, where right indication does come in. So this is the difference between the West and what's happening in India and Indian subcontinent. Uh, pediatric and adult, if we look at it, data that we have now, so again, mass related donor, seems to be the one, but people are doing mass transplants because of the registry that have we have in the country and also whenever possible getting uh, donor uh, cells coming in from Europe or US or across the world. Haplos are the one that, uh, which was not there before 2012, of course, across the world that happened and seems to be uh, picking up both for pediatric as well as for adult. So this is a breakup of this uh, same thing that how things are being done. The mar sources, bone marrow sources, uh, seems to be again, you know, more more people are preferring peripheral blood because the technology you have simple to do. You don't need a theater, you don't need anesthesia, etc. Cord blood is the one thing that is really hardly something is happening in the country. It's extremely difficult to um, do it. So I suppose that the cord blood, as time goes by, uh, not many people or hardly anybody will do it. The one center who has been very active, they also feel that probably not worth doing cord blood now that we have other sources of graft. So coming to the science of haploidentical transplants, and at the heart of it, any, any transplant that we do, the graft acceptance is the one that first few days we keep looking at whether it is grafted or not. Not easy to know that whether accepted. First couple of weeks, we don't even know whether it's accepted or not because number is so small. Um, but maintain a graft versus tumor effect. 
with the reduction of graft versus host disease. And then in haplotransplants, you use drugs like uh, post-transplant cyclophosphamide and others like ATZ. There are some centers do prefer ATZ. My experience is extremely low with ATZ. There is a little bit with uh, PTCY. And I feel that uh, PTCY is so much easier to uh, use, understand it a little better. ATZ is so much of unpredictability. But Results would show that there is no randomized trial that it's a so cyclophosphate is a very versatile molecule, whether it's for good or for bad. It has its cytotoxic property, it has its immunosuppressive property, it can spare you know, hematopoietic stem cells. Uh, we we came to know about it very early in early 80s. Uh, sometimes CMLs were very, very difficult to treat. There was no hydroxyurea, no malfalan, uh, no buzalfan. Dr. Agarwal will know about it, how challenging what is. So people started using any kind of drug. So some people we have used in a phytos uh, cyclophosphamide in grams. And, but um, we wouldn't lose anybody. Uh, counts will go down and then uh, we'll come back in two weeks time. So it did spare uh, hematopoietic stem cells, both normal as well as the abnormal one. Um, didn't produce much of uh, cytogenetic response. If at all, there was a very small number. So, but we did understand even before autologous transplant was used across the world. So we had our own experience. Of course, it's carcinogenic. There's no question about it, especially the urinary bladder and then other conditions also if you combine it with radiation therapy. But this is a this is an important molecule for us. So when a um, group from uh, Johns Hopkins did it, um, when they did a lot of work, animal experiments and other work, laboratory work, they did it. So their whole uh, explanation was that it prevents graft versus host disease by inducing alloreactive T cell dysfunction and suppressions. That's the work they have. And there was a paper in, uh, I'm sure you people have all have read it in general and clinical in investigations. They looked at it, said that there are many more mechanisms of uh, post-transplant cyclophosphamide when you use on day three and four. Uh, they are the ones that, and each ex they did experiments on everything to show that it reduces the CD4 cell populations. It's unable to prevent proliferation and preferential expansion of L-reactive uh, T cell receptor, CD8 positive cells, persistence of, of CD4 positive cells. Thymus seems to be dispensable when you see it here. Yeah. Um, PTCY. But the important ones are that functional impairment of L-reactive T cells. And I think the important one is the expansion of the T-Rex. That's the one probably that brings in homeostasis in a setting of transplantations. So they did experiment, showed it, and then this article seems to be important. People followed up. One of the latest ones, last week it came in um, that uh, blood advances, and that showed that you know what PTCY does, that indirectly, they bring in uh, myeloid-derived suppressor cells. And the myeloid-derived suppressor cells come from the donor stem cells and uses a proliferation on day five. And that seems to be very important. They also indirectly influence the T-Rex. So myeloid-derived suppressor cells, one is we don't talk about much at this moment of time clinics, but it seems to be very important. Uh, um, uh, these cells are very important in development of uh, many malignancies, not only the hematopoietic malignancies, also some of the solid tumors. And I think we'll get to see. So they did an experiment and they showed it that uh, myeloid, so that you don't want to really suppress development of these cells by using a kind of immunosuppressive drugs. If you can have a good number of myeloid suppressor cells on day five onwards, seems to be important in suppress or bringing about uh, increasing the T-Rex and then homeostasis. So this uh, paper says that the key points, uh, PTCY prevents induction of GVSD from subsequent cell infusion um, via an indirect effect on the uh, uh, T-Rex. And uh, PTCY modifies that environment and it's conducive to expand the myeloid-derived suppressor cells. An important uh, um, laboratory experiment, I, I believe, and you need to know more about it. Uh, experiment that is not over. I don't think it's a final word. Much more to be understood that kind of cytokines and the cells, they, they just regenerate after the um, transplant, especially in the haploidentical 
support. It may have been in mud as well as related transplants. Uh, I think we need to uh, understand it's an, every subset so that we can have more um, post-transplant care and manipulate in vivo. So um, non relapse uh, the haploidentical transplants compared with, this is uh, one of the meta-analysis published in JAMA before COVID and a uh, uh, good number of patients, thousands of patients, they uh, looked at it and looked at what really uh, 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 non relapse mortality favors haploidentical transplants. It scores over uh, mismatch unrelated donor transplants, clearly, uh, but not over match-related donors, we don't see it because it's um, uh, probably more toxic. And in MAT, uh, again, also, it, uh, it seems to uh, favor the non-relapse mortality. So haploidentical tra transplant probably can reduce relapse uh, through trans this blood. Then the post-transplant relapse also, if you look at it, and probably doesn't go much over others, whether you do it at a, a mismatch unrelated donor match related donor or MAT transplant, et cetera. Um, it doesn't seem to score over that one, but there are different studies that are showing it. But overall, if you look at it, probably MAT transplant scores a little bit over the relapse. Yes, uh, what I said in the, not in the earlier slide, I think MAT seems to be better preventing relapse than haploidentical, at least from the meta-analysis analysis and some other studies. Viral infections, when you do apply identical transplants with PTCY, probably, you know, that that's, that's I was uh, helping on the kind of cells that we are left in the body while regenerating. When you have immunosuppressive conditioning regimens, then you uh, bring uh, your hydrocyclophosphamide, probably immune recovery uh, occurs in a, a different way from the related donor or much unrelated donor. Um, I believe the data that's coming out in the country, 100% uh, people reactivates CMB and also other viral infections, uh, VK virus, adenovirus, et cetera, seems to be more. So when we do a haploid clinical transfer, would I use PTCY or ATZ? And it's a, so much of closer monitoring and everyone needs so many drugs. Drugs themselves are pretty toxic. And that leads to uh, increased morbidity and mortality, increased cost, et cetera. So I think it's important that we understand uh, uh, immunology of doing haplotransplant uh, in, a, in a much better way. It's not that four out of 10, five out of 10, six out of 10. I think we need to understand if, every uh, uh, the system of the HLA. Uh, if you have a knowledge of pedigree, it's much more helpful, but it's probably even beyond that. So uh, mm -hmm. um, other things, DSA, et cetera, I'm not talking about, but even for looking at the HLA typing, um, I see that people, five out of 10, let's do the transplant. Probably that's not the best thing to do. I think we need to talk a lot about uh, haploidentical transplant before picking up the right donor. Uh, how to uh, improve in the meantime, because you know how to keep these T cells in a uh, homeostatic uh, situations. People are talking about checkpoint blockers, keeping it CAR T cells, et cetera, part of the transplant. Uh, definitely no question, it will be much more labor intensive, but the work has started and people are doing it. And then we'll continue to see, especially coming out of the larger institutes, work being done in these areas so that we do have a better um, immunological milieu in uh, post-transplant setting in all allergenic cases. So uh, understanding from my side, I keep thinking about it. Um, it's, it's a very dynamic situation when you do have transplants and donor cells are trying to understand the host. Host is trying to make space for the donor cells. It's very dynamic. It's happening in hours, not even in days, etc. So we talk about a couple of doses of cyclophosphamide, ATZ doses, low dose, intermediate dose, high dose. Probably it's not adequate. And then of course, bringing in other drugs. We do have knowledge about calcineurin inhibitors, mycophone like mofetil, corticosteroid, et cetera. But still, I think we need to keep uh, working on this place because T cell repertoire, so heterogeneous and so dynamic, and even a given individual, ethnicity will be another important thing. And then uh, I suppose um, uh, much more to be done, understanding, um, bringing new drugs 
new way of using the older drugs to uh, bring about uh, a milieu where uh, host and donor cells will uh, stay in a manner that uh, will kill more of the tumor cells, but will not for graft versus host disease. So PTCY, so did we standard of care for all allogenic transplant? Haplo, we have enough data, yes. Uh, it needs to be, it's one of the most important drug and along with ATZ. Um, uh, uh, for others, like match sibling donors, unrelated, um, then uh, uh, any kind of transplant that you do, and probably people are beginning to explore it because uh, with experience increasing and people feel that it's it's quite easy to use it. People, well, we'd have been worried about the 50 milligram per kilo per day for two days. That's a huge dose. And then with it, but the, the way it spares the hematopoietic stem cell is remarkable. And uh, people have, uh, we've seen in 2019 and 20 papers uh, presented in ASH and other hematology meetings that uh, uh, it can be used uh, safely and effectively in mad sibling donor as well as uh, mad transplant situations. So uh, then uh, regulatory T cells, how we can expand it in vitro, in vitro or in vivo will be the one issue that uh, we continue to explore, especially in the laboratories. And then the one experiment that I have shown that way people have found it, both in animal as well as the human experiments that, that came out. Uh, that is from That was from NCI data. Um, so Indian registry data versus allogenic data. I'm slowly closing the talk now. Uh, what we do in Indian registry, it's still, uh, still we have a larger number of patients with non-malignant disease, thalassemia and bone marrow failure syndromes. A mass-related donor is still preferred because we still have it. And then, of course, um, many cannot have uh, much unrelated donor. We definitely need a uh, more robust registry. Haplotransplant are rising. And because this is rising, we are not looking at much unrelated donor. It's an important donor source. Um, how to increase? Young people will continue to work along with NGOs and other organizations. And umbilical cord transplant probably is going to have its own death as time goes by, except in Japan. They are very well organized in this area. But next decade will be very important to see that what happens to this donor source. Then, of course, we are doing transplant in older patients. But this problem remains of CMB. I keep seeing it in our hospital in other places that how challenging it is to get the drug very quickly for CMB when your uh, uh, standard drugs are failing. And, of course, MDRO in the larger centers is a massive, massive problem. And then for that, probably immune manipulation will be the way rather than looking for better antibiotics or antimicrobials, which is which is not many pharma industries are interested in. So finally, that allogenic transplant is all about learning immunology. Keep talking about it, understanding it. We have debates. We continue to have those debates and see that uh, how we can improve upon the results that we have at this moment of time. Uh, this is one for the young people, those who are doing it. Um, yeah, at the beginning of the, uh, any get into the branch, the German saying, this is Venkat Raman Ramakrishnan, the Nobel laureate, say that you need four Gs. So you want the geld, that's money, of course, to do your research and your clinical work. Then Jessic, that's a skill. You have to have it. So good experience. Keep learning about it. Kettle, that's a patience. Very important. We lose our patience very quickly. And of course, finally, luck. So we all, all rode on our luck. People are doing it. And the luck for the patients and everyone in the society. So four Gs are very important. It seems the scientists and the clinicians. That's all I have to say for today. I think panelists will pick up these questions and debate and give us some uh, more answers. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Tapan. Lovely. As a non-transplanter, everything was good for me. And I'm sure others have also benefited. Student community that are listening must be tremendously benefited from your review, experience, and the philosophical words. So we have a couple of guys here who will like to interact with you. Uh, anybody would like to have some questions for Dr. Sapan or your experiences sharing? 
Yes, Hari. You are muted, Hari. So, sir, as usual, a pleasure to hear and uh, to see hear about the overall personal views of transplant, actually, and which you can only only you can do that in such uh, with your great experience. Um, my question is more philosophical. Do you think that uh, allogenic stem cell transplant has a little bit suffered because it has been used as a salvage or as an answer for everything without being discerning about where it has to be used with effectiveness? And in your, uh, in your uh, uh, experience, what is the single most important that has actually uh, improved the outcomes in transplant. Uh, you have all these immuno, immunosuppressive drugs and calcium, but we don't see anything better happening uh, beyond the calciurins and the steroids over here. And we have so many other drugs. And is it all about a trial and error method? Or is it just that we are still not understood about the T-cell, uh, how the T-cell works? Yeah, Hari, I think uh, immunology is one that uh, nature's biggest mystery. It will unravel slowly. I'm saying what I understand. I think it's impossible to understand immunology in total. In COVID era, we know that how little we know about immunology still where. Um, allotransplant, we all know that it gets rid of a number of diseases. There is graft versus tumor effect. There's no doubt about that. But as we understand the other aspects of development of different diseases, whether it's malignant or non-malignant, that's, that's, that's the most important thing. Once we understand, that's why I said allogenic transplant is at a crossroads. We are not doing transplants for CML now because we understand better. CLL we do not bring into transplant. So um, I'll give a philosophical answer. Way back, uh, Donald Thomas said, the last line, you know, he wrote an article in one of those older journals that people don't read. We don't read either archives of internal medicine or uh, one of the American journals. We do allogenic transplantations because alternative is not better. That's ultimate. And that became true later on because when we did so many transplants for um, CMLs, we don't do any more. So once you get better answers, and we seem to be getting for different diseases. How many Hodgkin's will come to yellow transplants now? Now that you just bring in very carefully with our immune checkpoint inhibitors and then uh, um, antibody drug conjugate, et cetera. So I think science continues to improve. And then uh, um, similarly, and I, I'm, I'm concerned about multiple myeloma. So of course, for 25 years, I defended it. Every meeting, Dr. Uh, Agarwal will ask me, do you think it will last? I said, it will last for 25 years. So it has lasted for the last 25 years. But uh, I can see that in the next decade or so, autotransplant for um, multiple myeloma might go down. There's a very strong possibility. Uh, let's see what happens. Um, probably that's it. I think that the, uh, we want simple questions, simple answers, uh, very easy treatment so that patients can walk through it. In allo transplant, some of them, 30% walk through it, 40% limp through it, and other 20%, they just don't get up and walk. And that's that's the real challenge we have. So, I, so, yeah, so I, about, about, the myelo, about the myeloma thing, which you say, I mean, I will just beg to differ because I think it would be individualized for regions, patients who have uh, I mean, uh, countries which have the ability and the support to be able to cater to non-transplant options, which are frightening expensive. Uh, uh, and uh, there's no end to, uh, to to stopping these therapies, whereas you find that an autotransplant uh, may be still relevant for a long time uh, in, in India, uh, and, uh, and related, I mean, in the, who are on the same economic uh, uh, a platform uh, because it becomes uh, a, there's no questioning about the fact of its utility in improving long term uh, uh, progress free survival or relapse free survival of these patients. Yeah, no, um, I, you were right in 2023. You were right. I put the milestone at uh, 10 years from now. In 10 years, in, in, in modern medicine, is a long time. So yes. let's see what happens in 
2033 or 2035. Let's see. Right, sir. Yeah. Hari, any more questions? No, I will think about it a little bit later. <laughs> we'll take one question from the audience. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Gopinathan wants to know the preferred dose of PTCI in MSD transplant. Uh, it's going to be difficult to give that answer because uh, people are exploring all doses. A majority of people still continue to eat 50 milligram per kg on day three and four, but there are data coming out uh, as um, abstracts. You can see that people used as low as 25 milligram per kg for two days. So I think it's an evolving er um, area. Um, why it should be less in MSD, we do not know. It should be same perhaps. Um, but let's wait and see, you know, we need more data to understand, you know, and talk that uh, and now at the moment individually, if you are doing it, you will choose uh, to be uh, be on the safer side. That's what we always think about it. Being less dose, we feel that uh, we, we are safer. I think that's what's happening, you know, why we choose 25 over 50. We don't want patients to die quickly, but with a scientifically right, I think we need more answers from uh, animal experiments, some of the human data. Until then, I leave it to you to choose your dose. Thank you, Tapan. Back to the faculty here. Mal Malik Arjun has raised the hand. Malik Arjun. Sir. Yes, sir. I hope I'm audible. It's a wonderful uh, talk, really. Thank you for that, sir. So just continuing on the same topic that you were speaking. So uh, with PTCY, is it possible to do away with MMF? How important it is? Because in some of the transplants when the engraftment is delayed, we oftentimes don't start it or reduce the dose. Your take on MMF and its utility after PTCY. In uh, allogenic hematopoietic stem cell transplants, I can see that uh, papers that it has never found its uh, place. Uh, what rightful need not be used. It has never found whether to give a treatment uh, two drug combination, three drug combination in treatment of uh, acute GVHD. So it's not a drug that um, we can really rely on. So I know, I understand that um, how MMF works, all three drugs that we use, uh, we use uh, metotrexate to um, kill the T cells as early as possible. Then of course, calcineurin to uh, modify the T cell function. And this is of course to uh, prevent formation of those T cells responsible. But what dose? That's another thing. And higher dose, you are worried about it. So my very frank answer is that I don't know. Um, don't use it now. Use it in the beginning when you know a new drug comes in. You are all excited. We use it. And probably uh, I find it difficult to use it because I don't understand this drug in hematopoietic stem cells. Do you have any any anything, any explanation from your side? No, sir. Nothing, nothing yet. Thanks. I mean, how, how long does it work there to use it? Because if you want to prevent formation of the T cells, it has to work very quickly. And uh, I have not seen much data in the literature that how quickly it can work and prevent formation of those cells which are responsible for drug process host disease. Thank you. Thank you. Malik Arjun, any more question from you? Not at the moment, sir. Thank you. Okay. We take one more question from the chat box. Um, Dr. Faraz Khan, actually you are here, you can ask directly, but I'll read out your question. What is the most common drug used in your setting in steroid refractory acute GBHD? <laughs> Difficult to answer. <laughs> um, <laughs> probably we would like to use the drug now that uh, more recently um, approved drugs. So, uh, but um, um, I don't use considering inhibitors. Probably once that comes up, uh, not. Uh, uh, we have used everything because there is no standard of care. You just don't know. You use everything. You sometimes use uh, weekly metotrexate, weekly cyclophosphamide. I'm talking about the simple things. And then, of course, now that you have the drugs, JAK2 inhibitors. Probably I would like to use JAK2 inhibitors if it is um, affordable because it still remains expensive. We couldn't use it for a long period of time because there was no indication approved in the country. It was only for uh, a <clears throat> myelofibrosis. So I think that's an approved drug. We have used uh, BTK inhibitors also. So keep on using. But those who are steroid responsive, all kinds of drugs we use. Um, newer drugs, of course, we cannot use it. We have no access to it. Um, 
we raise our hands and see that you know someday uh, host and uh, um, donor cells will understand each other they will stop fighting and that i think in practical it happens to everyone every case after using everything i i i i'm a believe it's minimalistic things i don't just bring in second drug third drug fourth drug etc so uh, uh, making the whole situation more complicated allowing some of the uh, donor cells to identify the host cells in a better way thank you irag has the raised hand sign irag Ah uh, yes, sir. Uh, a wonderful uh, overview and some of the very interesting points you have raised. Uh, one of the uh, uh, points you mentioned that uh, we do transplant because we have nothing better to do. Uh, you know, in that line, uh, I wanted to ask about the role of allogeneic transplant in multiple myeloma and Hodgkin. or even uh, other lymphoma and you know i uh, see these patients in second opinion or others where the you know somebody has uh, very strongly uh, advised the transplant saying that since you have a bad disease and anyway there is uh, nothing better for you to do kind of in summary you know you must go for allogeneic transplant uh can you given yes. understanding of you know where it should not be done or in your practice where would you transplant these patients or would you rather do something else uh, and not transplant so sir so, we are in the same boat i will quote two experts one is when in a panel discussion uh, next to me was john luc harisu you all know he's retired now from france who has done so much of work in uh, hematology especially in uh, multiple myeloma he just whispered in my ear don't ever do allogeneic transplant in multiple myeloma i listened to him and i have followed that so wow. that I think myeloma is so difficult to do allogeneic transplant it's not that we have not done everybody might have done one or two but that we do probably when we are everything is back to the wall it's a very difficult situation and there is doctor so you know there is a proof that there is a graft process myeloma effect in allogeneic setting we in donor lymphocytes long back guido trico had shown that um so that's in myeloma probably i will have no courage to do allo transplants maybe very young people everybody coming forward and understand. understanding and then second one was there about uh, hodgkins again another quote 2018 or 19 in ash so while speaking in the education sessions he was asked what will you do for us in hodgkins lymphoma which is refractory to multiple lines of treatment you will use the immuno and new immunotherapy drugs or allogeneic transplant he said i will keep allo transplant as a second option and that's coming from expert so i that's what i try to do um uh, allo transplant in hodgkins lymphoma probably it's difficult um, but it's curative so we can't forget about it so uh, uh, some people would definitely need uh on the same way some of these other difficult areas uh, myelofibrosis when to transplant uh, you know what age or other patients you those are another you know Again, experts will say delay, delay, delay. You don't want to kill them early, and delay how long? That's a big question. See, your dips, dips plus everything, keep doing it, and I suppose <laughs> we'll have to have a better drugs for myelofibrosis. Uh, transplant is difficult. It's a relatively rare disease. Most of them would not be able to undergo transplant. So again, I there is no answer actually. It's a very difficult area to answer because number of transplants mm -hmm. done no randomized trial is possible so you do the selected selected cases as as we all do beyond that i suppose by the right moment to my answer is the delay don't do it early uh, expert opinion yes chirak any more questions hello uh, thank you sir okay dr anand yeah good morning sir excellent talk and it was it's always a pleasure to listen to you my 
question is that we uh, although the west and the europeans the, the americans they do a lot of unrelated donor transplants and we as a country for the last uh, 10 15 years we have not really actually improved on those numbers for unrelated donor transplant although now we've got datri which is a uh, very which is which has got a good number of registrations and why what is what do you think we should do in future i mean because although haplo we know that with haplo we have got so many viral infections even with mud we would have but but that is something that we have not explored as much as haplo and is it because we as indians are not philanthropic enough or it's just that we need to improve our push in that area and we are not focusing in that yeah Anand, i think it's a very important questions you have raised um, there should be more much unrelated donor transplant in the country because it's a very effective way of um, treating uh, these cases who require it. Um, involved in the field for the last 40 years, I know that when these things happen, people, those who suffered in Western countries of Indian origin, then they lost their near and dear one. They came here. They said, that we want to develop registry. But developing registry is a massive commitment. It's not only the finances, much beyond that, and uh, I think uh, th this is what uh, they did, you know. Um, Dutri has a tremendous amount of work, but they have been repeated. Last 40 years, people have tried, people here, people coming from abroad, those who have resources, finances, but it's tough. You know, you need a team, you need a huge finances. Then the, how do you get your donors? You know, Dutri or otherwise, donor attrition has been a big problem. Young boys and girls, they donate their blood. HLA typing is done, and then when the time comes, the parents don't allow. Attrition rate is 40% and higher. So that our education in the family, educated family members also, they are not. So we need in all across the country, we need really some, again, I think that this push has to come from, uh, rather than private agencies, it has to come from the government. When government pushes, everything moves. It's 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 just keeps on moving, keeps on moving. That push has not come from government agencies. We do understand what is the problems in the go in government agencies. There was a support also from umbilical cord that they there will support, but that didn't happen. So I suppose you know you need a very well oiled organization and machine. Raghu did so much for Dutri, but Raghu is a different kind of a man. So we need more people like Raghu who can push forward. So you young people, if you get somebody, as doctors, you will not be able to do it. There's no question about it. The Anthony Nolan fund that came up in UK because of the lady whose son died because of lack of donor, she pushed it. But they, people will have to be from, you can be a support as doctors, a strong support, but it has to the, the citizens, the society will have to come forward in developing and maintaining it. That means like NMDP, they have it, that's an organization. The people they are working, the employees, they are paid. They don't have to worry tomorrow, what will be my job? Here people don't know if you go to agency and you can't do voluntary work. So it needs, I think that a lot of debate, a lot of discussion, especially discussion, and then uh, developing a fund a registry that the registry will be really you know, um, up and going and uh, really uh, don't know. The attrition rate, young people are ready to give it. So donor attrition rate has to come down. Otherwise, that tree would have been able to give many more donors. Very important area. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Anand. I don't see any other result sign or in the chat box, but if anybody wants to ask anything more to Tapan. Sir, I, I, I'll just ask one. So when we, uh, I mean, we have all, we have all loved treating AML and so it continues to be one of the prime indications for doing a transplant. And uh, acute lymphatic leukemia also is. But, you know, one would have thought that you have better results for transplant in AMLs. And still, still um, the graph versus leukemia effect is probably a little more potent in acute lymphatic leukemia. And you probably get some of the results, better results in AML. Why this sort of uh, discordance uh, in outcomes, one place where we rely heavily on graph versus leukemia effect, and which is not such a great thing in acute myeloid leukemia, but you get heavily dependent upon the kind of conditioning that we use and the subsequent uh, uh, 
international regulation uh, which allows for control over ALL. But still, you don't get that great results in ALL as you would get in AMLs. Yeah, I think these are two different diseases. ALL, when it elapses, you can hardly cure anyone, even with ALL transplants. So as a part of initial adult taking into account that graft versus leukemia could be so morbid and the mortality high. But AML, I think there is something subclinically happening. We are not being able to pick up graft versus leukemia effect. But the number of people that we take, if you look at, we are taking all comers, maybe a quarter of them already cured with chemotherapy. So that's the problem. When you do uh, LO transplant in CR1, now that MRD coming in, that's opening up another field. But if you look at the AML relapse, that's a real indication for LO transplant. But that's a kind of a myth because LO transplant, if you get 100 relapses, 50 would not respond to your reinduction therapy. You can't take them up for transplant very early because you know donor search, et cetera, don't get it, they die. So if you look at the statistics, a lot of them will go wayward. So um, Jacob Rowe once said it in one of the ASH meetings, if you want to do a proper um, randomized trial in AML, you need 7,000 patients. How would you get 7,000 patients in the whole world? How will you come together? So I think statistics tell is this one thing is that we are unable to do a proper trial. You can do in breast cancer because the number is so huge. You can do in colon cancer, but you can't do in acute myeloid leukemia a proper randomized trial. We just have trials, a few hundred patients here and there, but they statistically, if you look at it, and a heterogeneous group in AML. So we, which, which subset, which, mole, which molecular abnormalities, the AML will be amenable to immunotherapy but we still do not know. So when we do transplant, we bring them together, all comers, right? From good risk with relapse, then of course, intermediate risk and the high risk, and they keep moving from one group to another because of we understand more at the molecular level. So I suppose that again, right answer. I think there is there is a, a, some amount of drug versus leukemia effect. Probably it happens subclinically. We can't even pick up. So again, more laboratory research to understand that what happens at the subclinical level graft versus leukemia effect. One last uh, one last question, sir, about your thoughts on MRD. Is it purely is it telling you you have a bad disease if your MRD program is it, or is it telling you that you need to transplant because you have an MRD positivity? Where is the time? When you does MRD <laughs> is positive in AML, patient takes only two weeks to have hematologic relapse in 90% of them. 10% may have a different biology, you can transplant. So MRD is, I have a completely different tick. Uh, Hari Parmeshan immediately agreed once in a meeting. I said, why do you need it? He said, I don't do it because of that. MRD, MRD, I mean, when you get the answer, how many how many have been able to save? You know, MRD positive will relapse in very, very quickly in AML. So I think it's not like ALL where you have answers with the newer drugs. In AML, we are still struggling to find better drugs. So, MRD yeah. remains a periphery for me. Is that, the, is, that, is, is that the reason why much of the cellular therapies are still wanting in AMLs? Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Dr. Hita wants to know the role of allo transplant in uh, peripheral T cell lymphomas. Even autologous is so difficult to do there. Yellow transplant, I will have no courage to do, very honestly. I, it's one, of, one of the areas, these are the often areas probably we are still struggling to get answers and um, transplant will be extremely difficult, but everybody will do one or two here and there, rare conditions, but now that your brentuximab have coming, many people will use it, and after they relapse, very tough to really get the disease under control. So uh, there's no special yeah. answer from my side. Sorry, I will not be able to answer in a very specific way. Chirag. Yes, sir. I have two questions. Uh, one related to this study recently published in Blood about, I think, six months ago that uh, uh, you can do transplant in AML without the salvage chemotherapy directly going to transplant with equal results. So is that something we can start doing in practice? And if so, who are the right patients? And how is that 
study being uh, kind of uh, you know taken up in the transplant field uh, is it acceptable uh, strategy um, yes chirag i think these are uh, recent results but if you go back to 90s bill o'reilly from mskcc has shown it that if you pick up early and then of course results are better so that you have to have a whole you know organized work to get your patients you know that funding that they have all the funds necessary for a transplant donor is already ready so within less than a month if you can organize everything why not because bill or i think you go back to that paper bill or ilis paper for mskcc he was a pediatric transplanter but he did it i think people have followed up that work and shows that yes you can you know that uh, go ahead and quickly do it because we know that when there is a tumor burden is low then uh, mm -hmm. if you go ahead uh, and and then what happens when you give um, uh, chemotherapy or the newer mm -hmm. drugs etc for aml response will be in 50% 50% will not respond but if you can uh, bring you know take them up for yellow transplant very quickly in a well organized patients certainly but you don't have enough time in aml except in that very well organized settings so i mean can we say that the uh, the old philosophy of getting the blast below 5% is not required in every patient and is there a cut off number that you would use based on this study say 30% blast or 50% or which you know so practically how would you guide a patient now we will talk about mrd <laughs> as a prognostic not uh... As a predictive marker, it's very difficult because if we don't have do better drugs to patients, it's a prognostic marker. MRD negative, we know that majority will do well. So morphology probably is slowly going to the back seat now. We are comfortable morphology in the first month when we get it, but it's all uh, when your smile appears on your face when MRD is negative, right? Right, but this study, you know, kind of made everything look upside down. You know what we have been doing so far. That gives salvage chemo, bring the blast down. This study says you don't have to do anything, and you do transplant right away, mm -hmm. uh, no salvage, and the results are equal. So, are we, you know, wasting a lot of time and resources of patients doing salvage chemotherapy in AML? It's a very important work. Not that we have not done. We all have done this kind of transplant quickly, you know, telling people, but numbers are extremely small to tell the world that, well, this is the way to go about. These people have done it. I said, O'Reilly have done it. That's a very close follow-up. The moment you get to see, you know, pick up the disease relapsing at the molecular level or even at the gross level, AML, what is the first thing you see in relapse? Your WBC starts coming down. One, then 3,000. That 3,000 will slowly come down to 1,500, then start going up. So even CBC. 90% of the AML relapses are in CBC. You don't have to even do marrow uh, at uh, periodic intervals in AML. People don't do, I suppose, nowadays marrow regularly in AML. So yes, I think the transplant, you know, that very, very um, strong transplant team will have to pick up these and do. So day one, the AML comes in, you are ready for that. Not easy. Right. <laughs> Thank you, sir. The second question is about the MRD in ALL, as a lot of MRD is being done. And then the question comes about uh, transplant. So if you know, what would you do in your practice or if you can guide us that somebody gets an MRD positive, do you transplant all of them? Are there patients who you would say that no, you would uh, you know, they are not willing for transplant or uh, you would say that maybe do something more and then you can avoid transplant. Uh, we don't have Blina Tumoma, so uh, we have to either work with the regular standard chemo continue or transplant. So how to guide the patients? ALL in adult transplant is a very tricky thing. We do know that yeah, it's, it does work, but if you look at that, that paper that UK and then across uh, 
Atlantic, they did more than 3,000 people. At the end of it, they said, yes, there is grad versus leukemia effect, but on the other side, there the grad versus host disease as well. So I suppose if that's the situation, next ALL trial should be how we use a good drug to prevent graft versus host disease. If we can do that in ALL, MRD-based, yes, probably we can go ahead. But um, we are not doing enough in actually. And then MRD, if you read it, in pediatric, it's simple because most of them will go to MRD negative. But adult is which time point? After two, 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 two induction, consolidation, or all the important drugs are given, which is up to day week 20 or something. So the MRD, so data that German uh, literature, I keep reading again and again in different, uh, whether it is uh, the pH positive or pH negative, probably MRD negativity at the end of when all drugs are important, drugs are given in first 12 to 16 weeks will be important. We often take it at the day 33 or something like that, which in many adults, we may not get it. It's good. If you get MRD negative on day 33, fantastic. But the number may not be big in adult. So again, you know, biology will be different. Um, well, I think uh, I know that Blina is not there, but we need those drugs because that's why we have the literature that where, you know, that we can, uh, MRD positive ALL can be MRD negative. Then you choose that who will go to transplant, who will not. So unfortunately, we are not being able to move with the time the, especially with the waste with the newer drugs in acute lymphoblastic leukemia. And that's why I suppose some of the discussion that we have, um, it's almost incomplete at the end of it because we are not being able to talk about the newer drugs. So would you transplant all pediatric patients with MRD positive at the end of induction? Uh, I, you know, Slowly, I have cut down in pediatric so that I may not be the best person to answer. I will leave it to the people, those who are involved in transplant as well as CAR T cells, because CAR T cells made so much of difference. You know, that is probably, they are the people to discuss. And, um, uh, you know, that molecular landscape is so different in ALL and presentation and ALL at relapse, completely different. That means transplant alone may not be the best thing to do. I think much more. And of course, it becomes heterogeneous disease. And uh, one line answer is so difficult, Chirag. I think you face it every day. <laughs> we face it every day. Thank you, Chirag. Any more questions, Chirag? No, sir. Okay. Anyone else has any question? Okay, if none, then uh, Tapan, thank you very much for being with us. It was wonderful listening to you. A very, very philosophical talk and the question and succession, which was also more than uh, science, a lot of philosophy, a uh, lot of things which are unanswered and you uh, put that across. And I think the youngsters will definitely benefit from how difficult medicine can be. Thanks to our discussants, thanks to our uh, sponsors, thanks to our event manager and have a wonderful uh, rest of the day with your family at home. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much.